Thanks for joining us, everybody, for our Friday Five Live conversation. We're glad to have you all with us today. And if you have any questions or comments you'd like to share during the session, just use your chat feature. And if you can please select everyone there in the drop down box, that will just allow everybody to see your messages as they come through. And you all will have access to the recording next week. If you're a GoToKnowledge member, the recording will be on your dashboard and otherwise we will email it to you. And our host today is Meg Foster. Meg has spent 20 years in higher education focused on student success initiatives and working in areas such as orientation, faculty development, online learning, student leadership, and first year initiatives. And Meg, I will pass it over to you now. Thanks, Melissa. Well, it's so good to be with you all today. Um, and we're so fortunate to have um, Dr. Jory Hatzel with us. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're at a conference in person that must feel like you're in 2019 again. Um, <laughs> it's a strange feeling, yeah, but good. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and we're delighted to have you as we um, continue to honor, you know, our, our colleague Denise Sweat in this um, leadership series where um, I think she would admonish us, remember to not sweat it. Um, and I, I just love that that title that uh, I think Sylvia Dorsey Robinson was kind enough to um, to give us that that title. So we do want to provide for everyone, um, two weeks ago when we gathered together, um, we put um, together a jam board um, where folks could share uh, memories um, or fond stories of Denise and, and that's in your chat. So um, if you were a colleague and have something you'd like to, to share with us, we'll make sure that, uh, that um, Denise's family um, gets that. So it's a, a wonderful way to, um, I think, continue her, her legacy. Um, and in these conversations have certainly um, been incredible um, to, to really see, you know, all these lives that she's touched um, and then what, what that impact, that ripple effect, of course, um, has been. So um, we always do try to start off a little bit with humor as, as Jory. So we hope that everyone got some candy if, if that candy is your thing. And I know um, I probably was um, enjoying it far too much earlier this week. Um, but we also recognize in higher education November can be an exhausting month. Um, and so we just hope everybody's taking care of themselves. Maybe that is a sugar brush that you need to get through um, your day. There's, there's no scent in that or coffee. Um, we understand. So um, we do encourage folks, please, please use the chat to um, ask any questions that you have to, to share comments as we move through um, today. We're so fortunate. I know, Jory, you've had a busy week. You were wcet -ing it um, on Tuesday and at a conference. So just to really appreciate your time. Um, Jory Hadsell is the Associate Vice Chancellor of Educational Technology Services at Foothill De Anza Community College District. And you also serve as the Executive Director of the California Virtual Campus. Now, Perhaps I'm incorrect, but that sounds like two jobs to me. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like it. Um, yeah, so so uh, great. Thank you for having me here today. Um, and I just wanted to say too, my, I chose for my background today, Foothill College, because that's one of the first places uh, that I met Denise and of course had the opportunity to work with her uh, on that campus. Um, so just wanna honor our friend. Uh, yeah, so so the the California Virtual Campus is actually a statewide online ed initiative uh, for you know infrastructure, professional development, and really um, focusing on creating a student experience where students mm -hmm. can find classes and enroll in classes across the system easily when they hit a roadblock, uh, and and you know decrease their time to degree. So it's run out of Foothill De Anza on behalf of the state through a grant. And so I, I sort of have dual titles there. But. That's, that's really interesting. And so, I mean, how timely, how long have you all been working on this kind of initiative to impact student outcomes? I started, uh, the grant started in 2013 and uh, I was uh, employee number two hired uh, in 2014 once you know you can sort of get through the initial funding and they you know figure out how to bring people on board so I started off as our chief academic officer uh, and then when our executive director retired in 2016 I moved into to this role mm -hmm. and so we've been working on this for several years and in fact 
Uh, it was a good thing because when the, the you know huge pivot to remote instruction happened, we had some pieces in place that we were able to really leverage um, and expand to support you know, all of our 116 campuses. It's just remarkable to think about and, and to think about how important that is. I mean, so much of our data that we're seeing is that, you know, as we're coming out of this uh, time of pandemic learning and, and I loved, uh, had got to have a conversation with um, Dan Maxwell, who's the interim vice chancellor for student affairs at the University of Houston. And he was talking about how we're, we've, we've gone through the chaos, the, the crisis, um, and we're sort of in this recovery period as we transition into a new normal. And so um, I'm going to definitely want to pick your brain about what you're seeing as sort of educational trends, because um, so much of the national data is telling us students really, uh, you know, are in, want to continue to see online learning, they, um, those initiatives that came out of the need, you know, to pivot um, shouldn't go away. Um, and, and so we'll be curious to hear about that. We, we of course, always have questions um, that we've prepared. And, um, and I know Jory's kind of thought about some of these, um, but would also love audience, feel free to put in your questions as well, because I feel like we're so lucky to have somebody here who's really kind of at the forefront of online learning initiatives um, at a time when that's really shaped so much of our last, you know, year and a half of learning at all levels. Um, Jory and I both have three kids who spent time um, at, at elementary, middle, and high school, um, you know, and learning online um, from home as well. So, Jory, you've had a really interesting career. I noticed that you, it sounds like you got your start in the community um, college system. I love that. Um, and would love to know kind of how you came to this current position that you're in, this leadership position. Um, I think it's always so powerful when we hear stories um, about, you know, how this, the journeys that people have gone through, we realize that, that we can do those things too. And I think that was a big thing that Denise was always reminding us, right, that, um, the, the, our, our academic and our career journeys um, are unique and that we have the ability, the innate ability to um, reach these interesting um, positions and roles. So with that, I'd, I'd love to hear some of your story. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and, and I think our friend Denise, uh, I would call her a, re a relentless encourager, <laughs> right? Uh, you can do this, you know, you, let's find a way, right? Um, so, so my story, I guess, um, you know, there's sort of the, how, how did I end up in the job I'm in piece, but I think what's more interesting is probably just my overall journey. Um, so I'll share a little bit of that with you and, and please chime in anywhere as we go along. Uh, I am a graduate of a community college in California. Um, I actually um, am the first in my family to graduate from college. I had uh, some siblings and my parents had done some college, but, you know, really never finished. Um, and the community college for me was just really transformational. Um, I, at, at the time that I started, I was uh, really interested in uh, communications and broadcasting and that kind of stuff. And so being able to, you know, not only work on you know, the general ed stuff that, that you have to do, but getting access in a, in a really uh, small and comfortable environment to people and um, facilities and, and things that just created opportunities for me were, were amazing. So um, my journey really um, started with uh, community college. I, I in, a, in a lot of ways, lived uh, some of the problems that I'm trying to solve now. And that's just wow. really incredible and, and been a huge uh, source of inspiration for me because um, Following community college, I transferred to our state university system as a student. Um, I was working full time uh, through school and I just couldn't make the schedule and the commute work, right? Um, it was going to take me something like seven years to get all of the classes I needed for the last two of my bachelor's degree. And I stopped, right? I, I just like, okay, I'll figure this out later, have to work. Uh, I was starting a young family at the time and so, um, uh, that's part of my journey. And so after a couple of years, I had some really great mentors along the way. Um, I was, I had gone out and done some stuff in industry. 
uh, came back to um, actually work at the community college I graduated from because I you know, met some folks there. I had some skills that were helpful to them. Mm -hmm. And I had some mentors who said, I, I think they saw something in me and said, you know what, you need to go back to school. You need to finish your degree. You need to go on and get a master's degree. That's they, they called it your union card. Right? You got to get your union <laughs> card. You can't do anything unless you have a master's degree. So, so I did that. Um, I, I found the first regionally at the time, this was like back in early 2000s, first regionally accredited online institution, changed my major. It's like, what's the, what's the shortest path to get me to a degree? Um, so I ended up with the business administration degree because of the, you know, where my transfer credits and all those things were. Mm -hmm. And um, that really lit a fire because I was able to do it, right? Um, through through getting married, through having children in the middle of, of my master's degree, um, just saw the possibilities. And also, I think I'm one of those folks who looks, you know, goes through something like that and says, you know, this could be better, <laughs> right? right? I mean, it, you know, it was, like I said, it was early online, it was a little clunky, but you know, it, it, it got the job done. So, um, Fast forward a couple of years, you know, went went through and had some folks say, you know, you really need to get your doctorate. So <laughs> did that, um, just happened to, as a, a, a project uh, during my doctoral program, um, we had to go out and present at a conference, right? So a, a classmate of mine and I went, we, we presented to these uh, educational technology directors conference in California. And um, I remember this gentleman coming up to me at the end of that presentation and, you know, he was, he was trying to be funny. He was maybe a little bit obnoxious, but, you know, I met him and, and we exchanged information. Um, about a year later, um, I got a call and it was like, hey, do you remember me from this conference? Said, oh, yeah. He said, well, I've been hired onto the launch team of this new online education initiative. And part of my job is to recruit people who know about online education to be part of this team, you know? So anyway, that just led to some conversations and, um, you know, being able to learn more about the opportunity and mm -hmm. through a whole bunch of other little zigs and zags along the way, um, I ended up uh, coming on board. I had, at, at that point in time, I had been tenured faculty. I had been a department chair. I had been in, you know, various leadership positions. So um, it was part of, you know, the progression of my career, but that I think so much of leadership is recognizing those opportunities, but also recognizing them at the right time, because that opportunity could have come up earlier or later, and, and really it wouldn't have been um, sort of the right time in a lot of ways. And so, um, so I've just been really fortunate. We started this initiative with, you know, funding, but no, no playbook really other than a vision for what we needed to do. Um, we knew that there were some, there was some technology work we needed to do, you know, to, we have a hundred, at the time we had, I think 113 colleges in our system, 116 now, um, but it's, a, it's, it, it's set up to be competitive, right? Because you're fighting over enrollments and funding and things like that. Yeah. And so um, what's been so transformational about this opportunity has been, moving the dial toward a collaborative culture. Wow. And, um, you know, we started with course quality with a rubric that we, we knew we needed um, and with trying to get everyone to agree to move to a single LMS. Those, those were the two early targets we had. And I just learned a ton about, um, you know, working, I had been fortunate to have been part of our uh, district academic senate at a previous job. And so I had some experience with that. Mm -hmm. um, but we just burned through shoe leather and frequent flyer miles you know, around the state, <laughs> visiting every college, meeting with academic senates and, uh, you know, persuading and, and getting to a place where people felt like, you know, we would answer the questions we could. And if we couldn't answer the question, we'd be honest about it. Say, hey, we don't need, we don't know the answer, but we need you to help us. And, and that helped us as a team uh, and me as, as our chief academic officer. You know, there were, there were definitely the, the spears and flaming arrows that came at times. But, um, you know, you learn from those things. And, and what I would say is always 
focusing on what's best for students mm -hmm. was the thing that in the end, like having that as our North Star, really, and to this day, that's that's how we make decisions, right? It's not about what's best for the college. It's not about what's best necessarily for the faculty. It's really, if we're making decisions, and this is, Denise loves this stuff, right? If, right? if we're making decisions based on what is best for the student, how can that not be good for the institution? How can that not be good for the health of, of the, the, the college and the faculty? So mm -hmm. how I got here. I love that. I mean, what what an incredible journey. And I can really see that you as you're telling this story that, you know, I think you're so right about the timing, right? Because you had this skill set from this spot and, and this set of skills from this spot, and then it kind of all sort of comes, gets woven together. Um, um, Dr. Curry joined us in September for our first initial kickoff as we were um, looking at uh, leadership. And, and she really talked about the same kind of concept that it was the timing and then having that mentor who she used the term, put their boot in the, her back and kind of pushed her forward Yeah, and said, yes, you can take on this challenge. This, the timing is right. It's time to um, at, at our, our college, um, one of my mentors talks about, you know, the metaphor of a bird. Um, and, and actually what propelled her forward was one day there literally was a bird in her office, right? And she was like, this seems like the sign that it's time for me to fly on to the next thing. Um, and, and so looking for those kinds of um, mentorship, so oper important, I think. Um, and having mentor and, and like you said, having mentors who will I'll, I'll say nudge you when you need it, right? Um, it, it is really huge. I mean, for me, the, so the mentorship was was big. Um, I guess I could probably say a little bit more about you know the work we're doing now with the California Virtual Campus. You know, our goal is you know we have a large so, you know we have a large state, large system, yeah. so there's a lot of capacity there. You know, and so so. The CVC OEI was born out of the, you know, the Great Recession of 2010. Our state, you know, the budget went south because of the recession demand went up, and we turned away something like half a million students. You know, wow. over a year wow. or two there. But at that same time, there was this untapped capacity in different corners of the state, right? So, so that was really the impetus for creating this idea of the course exchange to say, okay, if we have online capacity maybe in some small rural communities or, or the other way around, right? Depending on, on what the need is for access. Mm -hmm. That was my challenge as a student, right? I had to drop out of school because I couldn't get the classes I needed. And so when we talk about student equity and mm -hmm. we talk about being student-centered, um, I know that I have, I have debt and missed, you know, memories of missed opportunities and all those kinds of things in my in my memory um, from having lived that. And so I think too, in, in terms of being a leader, um, it's important to connect with the work, right? Because there's sort of the timing of those opportunities, but also, you know, is this something that, that you can be passionate about? And so, you know, when, when I talk about equity and think about equity and think about putting students at the center of this process, it's, it's really about, you know, giving those students, I think honoring them by giving them agency and information to make the decisions they need to make for their lives. But also, you know, thinking about where we've come through the pandemic and the, the pivot to remote and, and to your earlier comments, right? S students don't necessarily want all of this to go away. Um, you know, now some students are like, oh, I, I had to do online. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the best experience or, or whatever. Um, and that's, that's okay, right? That's what we have on campus classes for. But what I think is particularly interesting is where we've come with student services. And that, you know, I, I think, I mean, I hope, hope it's not, doesn't offend anyone, but I think generally speaking, before the pandemic, you know, we had these these fragments of services online for students, okay. right? Sort of as a, okay, well, in the event you can't come to campus, you know, hey, we have two counselors that every Thursday between three and five, you know, turn on their webcam, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. I mean, I'm grossly overstating that. So, um, but just as an example. And so 
I think even the students who who are maybe like, yeah, you know, I might take an online class if I need to, but I think I'm a, a, a you know, I'm going to learn better in a classroom. Many of them still want their services delivered online, right? Particularly if they have transportation or or childcare issues or they're disabled or you know whatever the case may be. So the what you talked about returning to whatever the new normal is, you know, it's not the place we came from. It, it doesn't necessarily mean it's all online and everything online, um, but it's it's really I think we have to think about this experience for the student. Right, and be really less focused on our own institutions and the way we do things, and you know the the you know all the internal conversations that we have within um, our our colleges and universities, and really look through the eyes of students and you know listen to students, observe students, you know, and and that's something again um, that I think our friend Denise was so excellent at. Right. And, and just being unapologetic about it. Mm -hmm. right? This is this is what the students need. We have to do it. Um, so anyway, I, I think that's that's a huge piece of it. It was really connecting with that work in a way that um, drives you to to be, you know, relentlessly helpful to students in this way. I love it. Relentlessly helpful. <laughs> As folks know, I have to take notes while we talk because it's just such great information. And I'm you know, I. I think about you keep coming back to this really important word equity and, and access and and that's one thing that I I hope will not leave us from the last 18 months right is what we've been able to do as far as equity and access because now a student doesn't have to drive an hour to campus to come meet with their academic advisor you know they can use a phone because every, almost everybody has one of those um, to, to hop on a call, right? Um, a video chat or, or something like, like that to think of the students who are receiving tutoring services. Um, it, it is really remarkable to think in, in just my tenure in student services, how very face-to-face -face on campus we were and to see this, this evolution where I think we're trying to take the best of what we know of online learning right? Um, and, and we're so fortunate that we have this academic body of work, I think, that really informs us. Here's how we make a class engaging. Here are best practices for um, connecting with students. And so now we can transition that into our, our student services realm. But I also know that a lot of folks are exhausted doing that work too. I mean, it's been, it's been a lot, right? That, that Mona Lisa picture you had up at the beginning, I mean, I think like I said before we started, that really sums it up, <laughs> you know, I, I think folks are tired, right? It's, it's been a lot. And, and I want to also say, I want to recognize the incredible work that's been done in student services, you know, through, through the movement to remote. I mean, you know, what I said about where, where we were, I think before the pandemic, it's just been so awesome to see, you know, um, folks pick up, like you said, pick up, you know, what, what systems do we have? What can we leverage? What do we know about how to do this? And the fact that, you know, we're talking about things like, um, you know, co culturally delivering um, services in a culturally competent way, mm -hmm. you know, or culturally responsive. Um, that's fantastic because we're not, you know, trying to figure out how to plug in the webcam, <laughs> right? Like that was so, so 2019, right? Kind of a thing. <laughs> so um, I, I just, my hat's off because I think there's been just an incredible amount of work. And, and I think we need to recognize that the unique advantages of online are the things that we need to exploit for the benefit of students, mm -hmm. right? And then we use, you know, the face-to-face time for maybe for those students who need the you know more intensive support or you know um where, where there's just something some some reason right that you need mm -hmm. to be face to face um but you know that's a shift for folks and a lot of us got into this business because we love interacting with students oh, you know right you, you all the stories you know they come in and sit in your office and you know, you, you know all of those things um it's, it's something we all get to navigate together, I think, is figuring out what that balance looks like uh, going forward. Yeah, we, we've got a question that um, Azara posted that I want to get to, but 
but before we get there um, about mentorship, and, and I think this weaves into it as well. In your position as a leader um, at your institution, and, and I'm thinking about you know the teams that we work with, right? How, are, how one of the, the the themes that I am hearing coming out of this year that is troubling me um, are the number of wonderful staff people I've seen leave student affairs, leave higher education altogether. In fact, I just had a, a dear colleague post that. Um, you know, she's left the industry for ed tech. And, and that's a shame because she was, um, like you, a community college um, graduate who was just a phenomenal advocate for students. Um, and, and just this week, Inside Higher Ed posted that there's so many financial aid position positions open nationally, which is very disturbing because of, right. you know, wanting to serve students quickly, but also compliance um, functionality that goes along with that. Um, advice or recommendations in for for those of us you know in roles where we can help support our staff right to recognize this body of work that's been done this year and a half um, and to hold on to our talent because I'm just I'm really concerned that we're going to see some massive um, exodus of folks in the next year or so yeah I mean we're seeing that with you know quote the great resignation for example, right. we're losing a lot of our senior folks who have a lot of experience. Um, that's definitely happening. I guess, you know, in terms of advice, I mean, hey, we're all we're all figuring this out together, right? On, on the one hand, um, I guess I would say that, you know, for example, the financial aid example that you just used, there's, there's that um, level of technical expertise that's needed, right? You, you have to be knowledgeable and, and know how to, you know, compliance and regulation and, and process and all of that. Um, but also we need to find the people who have the passion for connecting with students, right? Because there's really probably not a, I mean, maybe outside of education, but in education, not a lot that's more um, daunting or sort of even almost humiliating for students than to come and have to ask for money and talk about how they don't have money. That's something that in our system, we are really trying to systemically break right. that down, right? So that we, we've we realized through a lot of the processes we have, a lot of the documents students have to fill out, right? Um, we're constantly asking students to tell us how poor they are. Right. And that's really a deficit mindset, right? It, it puts them in a place where they just think, oh, maybe I shouldn't be here, right? And so um, I, think, I think that's important. It's just like from a high level, you know, how do we look at the processes we have and the policies we have to say, okay, <laughs> this needs to like truly be a welcoming environment for students. And, and you have to have folks who can connect with students on the front lines to do that, right? That, yeah. That's a piece of it, I think for financial aid. I, I too am worried about talent. I worry about my own team, honestly. Um, you know, we we all just sort of like hunkered down and soldiered through like so many other people did. And um, so I think as a leader, if, you know, if you're formally in a leadership position in an organization, um, one of the things I had to do this last year, um, and actually really it's been more in the last four or five months, I had to show my team it was okay to take vacation time. Mm. I, I mean, I felt myself burning out as well. Um, and I, we literally had an explicit conversation where I said, hey, I'm looking at vacation balances. People aren't taking time off. You know, we're all working remotely. And, and there's a tendency to sort of use less of that leave when you're remote because you're yeah. you know, kind of fitting things in. Um, and some of the feedback I got privately from folks was like, well, is, is it really okay to take time off, mm -hmm. right? It's like, if we don't, I mean, we are our own biggest asset, right? In terms of the people in our organizations. So um, that's one thing I've done intentionally. Not, you know, it's not like I disappeared for six weeks, but hey, you guys, I'm going to be out on Friday or I'm taking two days off, you know, two weeks from now, kind of a thing. And I've seen some folks relax a little bit mm -hmm. because they're like, okay, you know, if the boss can do it, we can do it too. Right. So modeling, modeling, I think is important, especially mm -hmm. just, just healthy physical and mental health <laughs> types of behaviors, you know, uh, is, is really huge. Sorry, I'm I probably straight away from, from the question you asked. No, I no, that was spot on. And I think that's such an important 
I mean, having, you know, done this work for a long time now, right? There are always the blackout dates, you know, for these three months in the summer, you will not take vacation. I mean, you want to kill morale? Woo, that's going <laughs> to. Um, and it gets to the point where there's like, you know, two weeks out of 52 that you can actually take vacation. Um, and, and how healthy is that? And so I think it's wonderful that um, you're really shared that kind of journey. Gosh, I myself need to make sure I'm taking vacation. What about um, my team too? Because, and we've come back to this theme over and over again in our podcast conversations that if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't do the, the work we have is, is mentally and physically exhausting. Um, and we've got to take care of ourselves so we can yeah. do that. This self-care is important, especially, so for me, I, I, I'm i sure folks who work with and for me would say like, I'm pretty driven. And so, you know, if we're not intentional about communicating, you know, hey, you guys don't have to do it the way I do it, right? But sometimes I need to show you, yep, I'm going to take a little time as well. Um, and then talk about it when, I, when you get back, like, hey, this was really good for me. You know, I'm mm-hmm. like, re-energized or help me give me some time to think about uh you know how to do some things better differently Mm -hmm. really important um especially someone uh i can't take credit for the phrase but there was uh, someone recently who said you know going through the pandemic has been our shared trauma right all of us have been through a mass trauma in the last you know 20 months or whatever it is and and I think that's true, right? We, we're yeah. we're going to look back on this time period, hope, hopefully, uh, you know, 5, 10, 20 years from now, and just think like, oh my goodness, that was crazy, <laughs> right? right. Um, but we're not there yet. Folks are still in it. Um, you know, we just lost someone uh, in our family, not, not my immediate, but uh, my wife's family to, to COVID two weeks ago. Wow. It's still happening. Right. So just just knowing that we all have to, you know, give each other some grace, um, you know, be intent on the work, but sometimes monitor the level of intensity to make sure that we're not burning out our people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think Denise would remind us to do that. Right. I mean, she. She, she would certainly tell us we have to laugh along the way. I mean, right. If if, if we take ourselves too, too seriously. Um, without some humor. Yeah. Well, right. That's part of the medicine we need. Absolutely. So I want to get to Zara's question because it's a really great one about what advice do you have for those who are seeking mentors? Um, or if you have advice for leaders who could be potential mentors. And um, you know, important comment here, sometimes students, staff, and faculty from under, underserved populations and communities, economically, racially, et cetera, don't know where to begin to find the agency they need or the leadership or potential mentors uh, may not be looking in their direction. So I think um, Zara read my mind as far as kind of the path I was hoping our conversation would continue. I love that question actually. Um, and I know, you know, from being from an audience perspective, I've been in, you know, conversations like this where you hear someone say, oh, I had this great mentor. And you think, oh, well, wasn't, you know, wasn't that great for you, <laughs> you know, and, and, Truly, I mean, I guess I what I would say is there was no one mentor really. Um, I mean, I think for me, describing it, it was sort of a mix of encouragers or sometimes people in similar. Um, how do I want to say this? So, for example, um, someone who has pr- helped propel me along the way is someone who was a coworker you know, and who, who felt sort of equally at a point in time felt equally not discontent, but sort of like, Hey, there's, there's more out there. Right. And we would have those conversations about like, Oh, you know, what's, what's the next step and and those kinds of things. So it was a peer, right. Uh, Who I'm still in touch with today, who is like, Oh, it's so awesome to see what you're doing, you know? So now, now it's, it's, it's changed to an encourager. Um, I've also had, (laughs) I've had a few folks who I thought could be mentors who didn't work out. Um, I, I don't want to give any uh, identities away here, but um, I, I remember, I'll tell a little story. I remember sitting in um, 
the office of someone who was in a senior leadership position at, at, at one of the places I worked, one of the colleges I worked at, and talking with that person about, you know, I, I just sort of asked, like, you know, would you mentor me? Because I really, you know, I respect, you know, the work you've done and, and whatnot. Sure, yes, absolutely. Having this whole conversation about, you know, things I could do to move ahead in, in my career. And then about four or five years later, actually being a finalist for a position where that this person had left and gone to another college. I was a finalist for a position and, and this person was the hiring uh, manager, right? And I was like, oh, this is great. I get to go like interview with my mentor. Um, and I didn't get the position, right? And I remember asking during that phone call, like, well, you know, is there anything I could have done better? And the answer was no, <laughs> right? Like, no, there really wasn't, you know, this, we just went a different way. Um, just, you know, it's all about the pool, you know, those kinds of things. So those happen, those discouragements can happen. Um, before I made it to um, the online ed initiative and CVC, um, I had applied for several jobs and, you know, you go, you interview, you think you did well and, and, and it doesn't work out, right? Mm -hmm. That's part of what I learned in my journey was just sometimes it's sometimes it's about you and sometimes it's not about you, right? Sure. It's about whatever's going on within the institution. So I guess um, probably the most effective folks who've, who've mentored or nudged me have either been um, folks who I interacted with because I picked up some kind of informal leadership role you know, um, serving on a committee or volunteering to do something that probably other people didn't want to do. Um, but then building, you know, kind of creating a relationship there, right? Uh, and so I think that's something that most folks can do from anywhere in an organization, right? Um, as a, you know, so part of my journey, I didn't talk about, I have been in now literally every type of job position there is in the community colleges. I was a student employee, I was a temporary employee, I was a classified employee, I was a supervisory employee, <laughs> I was a faculty member, I was an adjunct faculty member, as a manager, and now as an you know, executive administrator. So, you know, at every rung of that ladder, I guess if you want to call it that, um, sure. there have been different ways to engage in the work. Um, and I think sure. ultimately, I like to believe that, um, you know, doing good work really helps. And, and sometimes you just find those people along the path who, you know, either connect with you or, or sometimes, you know, you can just kind of come out and say, Hey, how did you do this? Right. How did you get to where you are? Because people like to talk about themselves, <laughs> right? There's no, no shortage of that. And so I think learning to really listen um, and give, give some folks that opportunity has, has, has been incredible. And, you know, of course, connecting with folks like Denise, you know, uh, my good friend Pam Walker, who's been an incredible uh, mentor for me as well. There are many others. Um, and I actually, I said at the beginning, you know, this background was Foothill College. One of the first places I met Denise, I actually didn't meet her at Foothill originally. Um, she had come to um, our college to talk about um you know, technology and student services. And she was sort of on this little tour uh, where she was promoting the, um, the Foothill uh, Technology Conference that she used to put on. Mm -hmm. And I was just struck by her passion and her um, just drive, right? And on all the amazing things that, that were happening. Uh, under her leadership, and so uh, then, then going, of course, and joining the Foothill Danza District and getting to work with Denise was like the icing on the cake for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful story about Denise, and but I think also such important points that we just don't know who are who's going to be those. Certainly, we can be very intentional in reaching out and creating mentorship opportunities, um, but also being really open um, to realizing that mentorship can come from lots of different places. It doesn't, I, I think sometimes in conversations I've been in, folks feel like it has to be a very formal designated relationship, right? Mm -hmm. and, and realizing that um, it can be 
you know, up here, they can, and, and that maybe, maybe it's taking from different, okay, you're, you're supporting me in this kind of way. You're mentoring me here. You're helping me develop this skill set over here. What's that? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I think that's a great comment about the formal and the informal, because I think generally speaking, most of it's been informal for me. Mm -hmm. However, <clears throat> there are formal mentoring opportunities out there. And I, I think that's also a great path because you're, you're starting from a place where someone has already agreed they want to mentor someone, right? So there's a certain structure and commitment. Um, I was really fortunate when I was in my faculty role, I had a dean who, um, you know, I had, I had talked to and said, hey, you know, I, I love what I'm doing, but I'm kind of interested in learning more, you know, and, and finding ways to have broader impact. <clears throat> and she recommended, um, we had a mentoring program in our system for administrators. You didn't have to be an administrator, but you, you know, you, you could be sponsored by um, someone, you know, at your organization. That was terrific. Um, you know, I, I was, they, I was paired with someone outside my college so we could have really honest conversations and, you know, part of the ground rules were, you know, nothing's off the table. It's all confidential. Mm -hmm. um, and that was so valuable to me right to be able to do that so formal informal are both both great ways to go about that right and what an important I mean how wonderful to have that experience because I think about you know at the beginning of our conversation and we do have about four or five minutes left to wrap up that you talked about really this very careful navigation you got to do in helping 116 colleges I mean as part of a 23 community college system institution I cannot imagine tripling that number and trying to decide on an LMS, trying to, you know, decide on um, course quality initiatives and this, you know, coming to a place of collaboration. Because so often, in my experience, it's a, uh, it's a place of competition, right? Um, and I can imagine that all those roles and those mentors have helped kind of navigate some really potentially challenging conversations as you kind of move through, so... For sure. And I think one of the biggest lessons, like for me, so large system, right? We have over 60,000 faculty. I mean, you know, 2 million students. Um, but you know what? It's a small system. And, you know, I had some, I've, I've seen some things and, but also had some folks, you know, remind me along the way, don't burn any bridges, right? It, you'd be amazed how many times you cross paths with people that you meet in the system. And that has been so incredibly true. And so sometimes um, kind of tying in, you know, the mentoring conversation to this as well. Sometimes those mentoring relationships emerged from people I met at work and then met in another sort of work context outside of, you know, whatever that context was where we initially met. You sort of like see them at a conference or, you know, you end up on some, you know, working group or whatever it is. So, so I, I just always remember, you know, try to invest in the relationship building because uh -huh. that's also, that is also what has worked so well for us in, in getting so many colleges to a place of collaboration is, you know, sure there's technology work we're doing, you know, there's work we're doing with professional development, technology and all that. But, you know, I had, I had, um, our executive sponsor for this program would always say, you know, we're in the collaboration business, we're in the trust business, we're in the confidence building business, we're in the teaching and learning business. We also happen to be doing some work with technology, right? And that's really what helped ground and drive our conversations to a place where now I could say seven years later, right? We've, we've built the trust um, but it wasn't always fun walking into a room, you know, oh, you're the people from the state, they're going to make us, you know, give up our academic freedom and, you know, tell us what we have to right. do. Um, and now, I mean, here I am at, with our statewide academic senate at this conference today, and it's great, right? People are like, hey, it's good to see you. Like the, the trust is there and the relationships are there. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. I think individually building that can benefit us in our own leadership journeys as well. Uh -huh. I think that's a wonderful way to kind of wrap up because it is all about relationship building, right? Um, and Denise would um, be like front and center beating that drum and reminding us of that. And relationship building in our roles as leaders, relationship building in the work that we do to impact students 
and their success, right? If it's not, if we weren't doing that work of building relationship with, with students, I, they wouldn't stay at our institutions. They wouldn't be successful. They wouldn't be able to finish those programs. Right. Yeah, it's such a critical piece. Tori, thank you so much. I know it's you're in the middle of a very busy time, um, and I just really appreciate your time today and um, the insights that you shared. I've taken um, a lot of notes, um, some really important themes that you've helped remind us about and ground us um, as we continue to develop as leaders um, ourselves. So I really, really appreciate your insights and the opportunity to be with you. Thank you for the chance to be here with you and, and also to honor our friend Denise Sweat. Don't, yeah. don't sweat it, right? Right. <laughs> Gotta keep right. That, and, that mantra going. I know. And Pam Woodrose says thanks and that Denise would be so proud. So um, thank you, Jory. Well, thanks everyone for listening in today um, for our Friday Five Live. We're going to take off a little bit in the month of November with the Thanksgiving holiday, um, but we'll be back on December the 3rd um, and looking forward to that conversation. I think we're going to focus our, our discussion as we wrap up this year on um, how we can retain talent in student services. This great resignation, I think this is um, a conversation we need to delve a little more deeply into. So if anyone has any insights, we welcome those always. Um, we appreciate that. And Jory, thank you so much um, for your time. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. I hope there's time for rest and renewal for all of us. Thank you.